Welcome to A State of Mind, the podcast that brings together consciousness, meditation, mindfulness, psychology, psychedelics, and so much more in pursuit of this mystery we call life. This is Julian Royce. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, Today's episode is a political one. And so if you are really sick of politics, you know this might not be your cup of tea at the moment, but it's a good one. And I'm speaking with Theo Huresh, and I'm really grateful to get to have him on the podcast. He's actually someone I wanted to have on the podcast from the very beginning. Um, I met him by being a part of a philosophy club that he started uh, several years ago. Let me tell you a little bit about Theo here. He is a human rights advocate and a public intellectual. He has written hundreds of articles on genocide, climate change, fascism, and democracy. And he is the host of Conscious Business, a series of critical dialogues, which was chosen by Business Insider as one of the 100 podcasts that will make you smarter. So check that out. Uh, He's now written four books, including Convergence, The Globalization of the Mind, and his most recent book, the fascism this time, and the global future of democracy. And we spoke, he's in uh, England right now, working on a PhD. So again, really grateful to get to have him on. And like with all these episodes, you know, I don't necessarily agree with everything a guest on here says, but that's part of the fun to get to have these live conversations with different people. And um, in the case of Theo, I think he's making some really powerful points Whether you agree with his analysis or not, they're worth thinking about, they're worth talking about. Um, He ties Trump into this worldwide movement, so to speak, of right-wing quote-unquote populist leaders. I think in his book he disputes using the term populist in this way. But um, there are similar leaders to Trump in places like Brazil, the Philippines, India, Great Britain, Israel, and other countries he talks about. And there's a certain irony in that all of these leaders are rejecting globalism and international cooperation and see themselves as iconoclast, and yet they're clearly part of this larger collective movement um, that I think is rejecting globalism. So there's a certain irony there in uh, this rejecting of globalism, and yet it's happening on a global scale. I think at this point in human history, we can't ignore the fact that we're all connected, that we all share the same planet. Um, One of the most difficult issues for me is that of environmentalism. I think of all the issues facing us, this should really be one that unites all of us. We all share the same planet. You know, we all, things like pollution and climate change affect all of us. And I hope that collectively these issues bring us together because they really need global cooperation to to solve them, to, to improve them. Um, And so this question of fascism that Theo in his new book so forcefully raises is one worth discussing intelligently, even if you don't agree with him that Trump represents a new kind of fascism. And for me, you know, the history of it is is actually quite personal. I didn't, I don't believe I talked about this in the conversation with Theo, but I lost family in the Holocaust. My grandmother escaped Nazi Germany in 1938. So, so it is personal, and um, I think in Europe, the question of fascism is discussed much more seriously because of the, the history there. And like Theo points out, in America, we lack firsthand experience of how bad things can get uh, in, that, in that direction. So this is a more serious conversation for a more serious time. It's overshadowed by the upcoming election. I hope everyone here listening here votes you know, for whomever you support. And I hope our country can move in a more compassionate direction. And without further ado, I bring you Theo Haresh. I'm here today with Theo Huresh. 
Theo, thanks for being on the podcast. It's great to be here. <laughs> You're actually someone I thought about when I first started the podcast, which is about a year ago. So I'm glad to, to have you on. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Excited to be here. And we, we met at the Trident Cafe in Boulder, Colorado, which is a really cool little bookstore cafe. It's like in my mind become like the quintessential coffee shop. <laughs> I did. I've traveled the world and it's the best I've ever found. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, and you're in, you're in London now, right? Uh, not in London, in the UK. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Great. And you started like, it was like a philosophy club, right? At the cafe. Yeah, about two years ago, weekly Sunday evening philosophy dialogue group, which you were a part of, a wonderful part mm -hmm. of. And uh, loads of people have passed through it over the years. And it's just a place to step back and examine all of our views from a wide-angled lens, mm. contemplate, uh, uh, kind of mental contemplation, just of what <laughs> we believe and what matters most. Yeah, and it's such a practice to put that in the words, I found. Yeah. <laughs> like often we're thinking something, but then putting it into words is another thing, and then writing it down is another thing. And you just came out with a book. Um, what is it? Let me get the title right. The Fascism This Time and the Global Future of Democracy. Yep. And um, I've been reading it and it's, I've been reading your Facebook post over the years. Um, and so this book is drawn partly from the, some of those posts that you would share on yeah. Facebook. Is it? Started with posts, turned the posts into articles, hollowed out a lot of the articles, right. deepened the articles. I've just been working with this material for four years now. Oh. I'm sitting Maybe before Trump was elected, since he just hit the scene, I was like, this guy is a fascist. <laughs> he is uniquely fascist. And we'll get into that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I want to um, recognize that you were, I, I remember that. I, I literally remember you talking about Trump before he got elected, you know, and how dangerous it uh, was, how concerned you were. But um, maybe before we get into all that, um, you are, you've been a meditator for a while. I know that much about you. And do you want to share a little bit about your background and your connection with, with meditation and philosophy? Yeah, I started meditating when I was 17. So a little over 30 years ago now. For a while I did it hardcore. I was doing a couple of months of retreat a year and um, probably did a couple of years worth of retreats altogether. Mm -hmm. Um Slowed down a bit over the years, but I still do lots of practice daily, all sorts of practices now, yoga and Tai Chi and meditation. It's just all part of the soup and mindfulness is tied in with my intellectual work. And um, pretty quickly after I started meditating, it was like a general blossoming, a general opening up to the world. So to me, that included philosophy and it included activism. It was intellectual. It was everything. It was just an awareness of the things that mattered most. And um, over the years, I watched people choose a route. They'd go philosophy or intellectual life, or they'd focus on contemplative practice, or they'd focus on activism. And to me, they all sort of went together as part of living the good life and sharing it with others. Nice. That's beautiful. Yeah, I love how um, you're making those connections. I think they should go together. And um, it's inspiring to to see, you know, you p trying to put that into action. When you, when you talk about meditation, were you like, do you have a particular school or style that you have done more of? I, I did a lot more in the Essing Goenka Vipassana oh, nice. branch of Theravadan Buddhism. Yeah. Uh, but I've, I've moved away from that significantly over the years. I chose that tradition at the time because it was cleanest with no sex scandals going way down to minor teachers i couldn't find any no money scandals that i couldn't find going way down to minor teachers and that inspired me and it made me feel comfortable um but it was also just easy to do low-cost retreats because it was on a donation basis um and at the time i didn't have the money to be doing that much i tried to give all i could and i still have a a debt that I owe them <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> will be off. Uh, but yeah, but it was also a somewhat confining tradition, um, right. dogmatic in, in some ways. I mean, it was supposed to be universalist, but it wasn't very sophisticated 
Um, and as I became increasingly intellectual, it began to feel increasingly absurd to sit through these lectures that um, mm. couldn't begin to account for the questions I had. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. I appreciate that, that you, the practice itself is very beautiful and powerful and simple. I mean, I've done the, I've done one of those 10 day retreats and it's amazing how they're just donation based and all that's great. But yeah, the, the philosophical, um, totally makes sense what you're saying because it's the kind of more narrow view perhaps. And yeah, um, I would imagine if I had just stuck with that practice after a while, I would want to move on. And I mean, I moved on anyway, I did it for a while, but not maybe not as much as you did. Yeah. But um, I would like to return and do that again someday because it is so simple and pure. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, I love hearing that meditation helped open the doors for you of activism and politics. Like they're not separated there. They're together. And um, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you sit day after day vowing to save all sentient beings, you have to take very seriously the structural conditions that shape people's lives and the lives of animals and the lives of ecosystems um, if we can call them lives. And once you begin looking at the structural conditions that support us, you immediately have to look into politics. And mm. politics is always going to be a contentious realm. It's going to be intellectual because you're making decisions that impact the whole of society. So you have to be thinking about social structures. It's mm -hmm. going to be contentious because there's many paths to the good life. So even in the best um, circumstances of a highly democratic system where there's great goodwill or even a, a an enlightened monarchy which i find almost non-existent in the world today um you're still going to have contentious decision making and you're going to have a need for answering questions of justice that are rarely settled in the world mm. um so i have to be confronting great pain on a mass scale that's not going to be humanized like it as if you were doing hospice work or if you were working with addicts or prisoners, all mm -hmm. this kind of service work that Buddhists tend to do that's very personal. But you want to diminish suffering to the greatest extent possible, and that means going into politics, which is going to be this contentious realm where questions of the good life are at stake, and there's always going to be massive co corruption that needs to be confronted. Yeah, um, yeah and it's always going to involve the the fighting that you're talking about contentious. And I think when that's fighting. done in a good system, like, I mean, we need to have debate. We need to have conflict in terms of the ideas so that we can have, you know, progress so that we can have, um, there should be different options on the table. You know, we're a very diverse world, obviously. So I think. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and once, and once you make space for that diversity, it all becomes so complex mm -hmm. and politics, becomes a, a more difficult realm. So, you know, when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, the, the Democrats and Republicans were, were much closer together. There was something much closer to a national consensus on all kinds of issues. And that's easy to participate in from the top. And it's easy from the point of view of the media. The media just covers what's happening and they all tend to cover the same sorts of issues. Now, there were real debates at the time. I think there were serious differences between the Democrats and Republicans. Um, but the, at many points in time, particularly, say, 1996, um, when Clinton ran against his own party for the presidency, mm. quite literally decided to triangulate the party and run from the center against Republicans and Democrats, you had a kind of convergence of the parties. But those type of situations are quite rare in yeah. politics. And now we have an incredibly divided society um, where yeah. I think there's, yeah, go on. Yeah, I just, I appreciate, we're starting to dive into the meat of our conversation, the politics. And um, I remember, you know, in the nineties feeling like this, you know, really fed up with the two party system um, that there's, this is a much more diverse world that we should have more viewpoints and I appreciate what you're bringing and talking about, which is like now we're in some ways entering, like all these different viewpoints are becoming more mainstream, becoming more talked about. The media 
has become kind of fractured through things like this podcast. Like there, it's, it's possible for anyone with the internet to reach millions of people. And um, I just have to say that it's not at all what I hoped for or imagined. Yeah. <laughs> There's just so many. <laughs> Yeah, we, still don't. We, we still basically have the two-party system, obviously. So it's not like, it's just so much dysfunction seems like it's happening right now. And in the midst of so much potential good and so much technological change, it's, it's just a confusing situation. Absolutely. We fragmented into epistemological bubbles. And, and epistemology is that branch of philosophy that asks, how do we know? And so mm-hmm. every group has their own answer to how we know. They have certain ways of gathering information. They have a certain aesthetic pacing to the way they gather information. The left tends to gather it on a weekly basis. Hmm. Um, Certain portions of the center and the center left that gather their information more through books and a leisurely paced New York Times articles that look at both sides. Hmm. There's another portion of the center left that goes to the Washington Post and they track things on a day-to-day basis, and they look very carefully at who's lying about what and how the legislation gets implemented and who's done what in the past, and they read less books, and they don't follow the news on a weekly or a monthly basis um, where you can get confused about cause and effect. Hmm. And each of these groups has their own aesthetics. They have their own music they tend to gravitate towards. (laughs) <laughs> you start getting tiny subcultures of bikers for Trump. Right. And, they don't, they, they don't believe in well, whatever, you know, you have all these different kinds of groups. Yeah. And that word fractured seems so apropos like that. We, I mean, even the left, right, conservative, liberal, I think that's always one lens to look at it through, but now we have, just so many different subgroups and, and subcultures and um, there's just a, there's like a lack of cohesion, right? There's a, a fracture and there's a, the media, the mainstream media became so consolidated for so long. and was so limiting that it's almost now like we're having this explosion. People can finally um, find their little individual niche, but then they silo there and it's hard for them to, to dialogue or think about other things or and i think it's it's partly an overwhelm of information that we're faced with it's it's becomes like a full-time job trying to think about and keep up with with the news and it's easier to belong to a certain group that can kind of that you you kind of align with to some degree i think to some degree like we kind of need to do that and we need to get behind a political party or a leader in order to get stuff done you know if you're constantly questioning all the time then it's hard to take action yeah the problem is each group finds their issue, there's going to be environmentalists that focus on climate change. Mm. And, there's going be, and, and they're going to have their websites that they go to. And they're going to have their political leaders that they look to. And then you're going to just shift a little to a more nature-oriented, contemplative environmental, environmentalism. Mm. The Sierra Club, the Wilderness Society. And these groups... They're not, they're not going to have that same focus. They might look at a wider array of environmental issues. And so when the question of climate change comes up, the climate change group is going to see them as um, kind of wishy-washy. Hmm. They're just as hardcore. They've got more issues they're concerned with. They, don't, they lack the same focus. And then you're going to have other groups of progressives. They're not focused on environmental issues. They've got social justice issues they're concerned about. They've got, um, they want to make sure that the economy is prosperous enough to afford all of the social safety net programs that they support. And climate change is going to be one of those issues. You're going to have groups of liberals then that say, no, we have to preserve the democratic system through which we pass all of these things. And there's a whole array of other issues that concern us. We have to be concerned about the geopolitical situation. Have we preserved the global order? Have we preserved the international organizations that are going to get things done? What about the alliance among democratic states that tend to support stronger environmental action, Hmm. that tend to support more progressive policies? Are we tending to those? 
And oftentimes those are off the radar of these other groups. And the, the trouble is, now this is just on the left, somewhat broadly speaking, just beginning to touch on it. Haven't touched the feminist groups, haven't touched Black Lives Matter. How do we hold a dialogue among all these groups so they're looking at everything? Oh, yeah. We're getting into an integral perspective. Oh, nice. Yeah, I appreciate bringing that in. I think, I think climate change is one issue that should really be uniting so many of us. And, and it's just sad to see how hard it is to, to have consensus around something like that, even on the left. I mean, even, I mean, I think there is some consensus and there is a lot of concern, but there's not like a real strong policy statement that everyone can get behind. It seems like. It's true, but you're going to have, once you go into climate change, again, it just explodes because Climate change, you've got questions of global climate action. Well, to have global climate action, you need to preserve the global order. You've got personal ethical action. If you want personal ethical action, you're going to have to do a lot of thinking about personal habits, and you're going to do a lot of educating Mm. about personal habits. You've got political action within the nation. Um, That could happen on multiple different fronts, or you could focus on energy where, where the heat's at literally, (laughs) Um, energy policy. But then once you get into energy policy, well, what are we going to do with nuclear? The United States um, is, our power is generated by something like 20% nuclear. Hmm. Um, I haven't looked at the numbers so recently. Um, These change somewhat rapidly. Um, Now, are we going to keep that nuclear? Well, it's not very good environmentally, according to a lot of people. I personally think they, they exaggerate this issue, mm-hmm. but it's carbon neutral for the most part. So it's incredible for climate change. We could keep right. developing it. We could maintain it, or we could go with these environmental groups over here that have always opposed it long before climate change became the center of attention. Um, but that's a threat to the environment because Germany did that after Fukushima, mm-hmm. after the Fukushima meltdown. And they wound up going significantly back to coal, not fully, but they got rid of their nuclear energy and they had to create new coal plants. You yeah. have a similar yeah. issue with fracking. So how, then the big question becomes, how do we maintain a dialogue that allows us to take concerted, focused action, that allows us to take serious action that counts for these big kind of questions that, that splinter us? Right. Yeah, I think the um, nuclear power is a good example and because um, it is better for climate change, and yet there are a lot of risks. But, yeah, I mean, it's a whole other subject. But my understanding, if it's done intelligently, it, it actually is a pretty good alternative. Um, I think I appreciate you bringing in the word integral, like the, there's these stages of human development. I know that's something you've studied a lot. And being able to operate from a higher level of development, of greater maturity, which in my mind means a greater concern for the overall good, like the good of the world. And so I think, I guess I'm curious your point of view on this, but like a lot of these issues we have, it's like when we have leaders that appeal to our selfishness, like in America, we're, kind, we're a selfish, you know, very individualized country. <laughs> and it's hard for people to, it seems like it's hard for people to care about the global environment in a way that I do. And I know you do. And I I mean, I think a lot of people do, but like politically it's easy to drive us into our narrow self-interest. And um, I see that as, as a huge part of the problem. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, well, when you appeal to someone's narrow self-interest, you narrow their moral horizon. Mm. So each of us, when we come to politics, we have a moral horizon that all the beings that we're considering, some people only consider their family members. Some people consider their family and their neighborhood, maybe their city, a little bit the nation. Some people, it's just their nation with these core groups in the nation. Some of those minorities, I don't know. I don't know about those, about those black people and those Hispanic people. I don't know if they really fit in. So, so they're gonna be white nationalists. And then you have nationals. No, we're all in this together. And everyone who's a citizen matters. And Americans matter vastly more than everybody else. But let's expand our moral horizons to include all people in the world. That starts to get really complex. Mm. Now we include all future generations with climate change. 
f- as far as we can imagine into the future, we're thinking about them with climate change or with nuclear proliferation. But we're not just thinking about future generations. We're also thinking about all life on Earth. And then we have to sort through all of that. And that requires um, an agile intellect, requires a wide moral horizon, requires dynamic thinking, mm. requires very abstract thinking. How are we going to abstract off of all these issues and come up with something that includes them all? And that requires a high level of personal development. And by high level of personal development, I mean that an individual has developed themselves on multiple different, in multiple different ways that allow them to take in a wider view, to see more, to feel more, to account for more, to be resilient towards more shocks, to be adaptive to more changes. Yeah. To also account for everything that came before. <clears throat> Yeah, I appreciate you bringing in future generations. Like that's something to think about, and um, it takes it takes some energy to think about that. It's incredibly difficult. How do we weigh the lives of people living in this generation or on on Earth today versus five generations in the future? We don't know what their lives will be like, so we have to account for them somehow. But it's hard to say that we're equal with them because we have to discount somehow the care we give to them just based on the fact that we have no idea what their worlds will be like. Hmm. And then economists will come in and say, if the economy keeps growing, if things continue progressing well, they'll be so much more wealthy than us. We shouldn't be concerned about them. But will things continue progressing in that direction? So you blow open these big questions Mm. Climate change opens up all these questions. It forces us to consider everyone in the world, forces us to consider all foreseeable future generations, Mm. forces us to consider every single action we take because almost all of it is going to have an impact um, on um, our CO2 emissions. Right to rearrange all political priorities. Yeah, it's tough tough to think about and to, (laughs) it's a lot easier to just think God will take care of it or, you know. (laughs) This is where we get into the forced regression that is at the heart of fascism. And by the forced regression, I mean, trying to cut out all of this complexity Mm. All of these ambiguous issues, all of this epistemological complexity with all of these different groups targeting all these different issues, let's just wipe it away. We're going to live in a fantasy world enforced through a big man, a strong man leader who punishes dissenters within his own cult of personality so that he can continue to maintain the illusion that has a few key sites, few key news channels, a few key TV channels that enforces propaganda. Right. And then to push us into a vastly more simple and less developed stage. And that's the big question. But to do that, it becomes an attack on the world because the world will leak through all of that. And every stage is going to leak through, and all the more so in the information age, where there are countless places where you can mock them for their ignorance and you can attack them for their lies. I mean, what I'm hearing you say is fascism offers an easy solution, a simple solution. It feels safe, maybe secure. In your, in your book, you tie it into uh, patriarchy and, and the, like the rise of women's rights and like gay rights and all that. And like, that feels threatening to people. It it appeals to returning to an older, safer world. Yeah. So um, anyone who's ever seen Downton Abbey, Hmm. um, watch the whole thing through, can get a sense of the way things blew open after World War I. Um, Countless millions of men across Europe and in the United States and a few other states 
had just fought in this thoroughly senseless war and were radically traumatized by it. And they'd just been through this horrible pandemic, worse than COVID, the Spanish mm. flu. And they come back and they demand rights. And women who've been back home have been working now. So they're given the right to vote all over the place in the United States and in Germany and, um, and in, in the UK. They, they, they start playing a more prominent role in the public sphere. And, but also you have this effort to grapple with the, the traumas of the war. Right. And you see this explosion in the arts and in psychology. You know, this is, this is when Freud is taking off. This is when a lot of the, um, the, the uh, most radical anthropological work, Margaret Mead's Coming of Age in Samoa, which blew the roof off of um, our conceptions of, of sexual norms. Um, it was when the, the automobile was coming into prominence and, and that freed up young couples um, to go off and have sex wherever they wanted to. Um, <laughs> the radio was, was coming into vogue, as was jazz. And, and um, this was a time of opening everywhere. And so, but then you particularly look at Germany and you see this thriving gay scene in Berlin. Mm. And you've got democracy now in this highly authoritarian society. And not just democracy, you have social democracy with, with the Social Democratic Party generally leading um, in the Reichstag, the parliament or Congress. Um, and so amid all of this, you have this effort to return back to um, monarchy, um, an authoritarian society, a more patriarchal society that's dominated by men. And you see something similar now when you zoom forward to Russia in the 90s, the society bursts open. You have the same thriving gay scene um, in Moscow. You have the same opening of democracy. You have the same exploration of views and journalism and Everything's starting to open up, but it's not working out so well. And they turn to a, a strong man in Putin. And the Germans turn to a strong man in Hitler after trying out a few others that don't go so well. Mm. And the United States experiences the same opening up in the information age. I take very seriously the research of Steven Pinker that, that postulates um, – through in maybe the most extensively researched book I've ever come across, The Better Angels of Our Nature, mm. that, the, that this period after World War II, but then building up, particularly after the Berlin Wall falls in 1989, and you sort through some of the conflict of the early 90s, the most peaceful era in human history, including within societies. And it's not just peaceful, it's a prosperous era. And we're starting to knock out poverty all over the world. But you have this very strange thing with the globalization, which is you begin to see what's going on on the other side of the world. That becomes very uncomfortable. Hmm. You, see what, you see into these people's lives, but they also see into your life. <laughs> All the things that you have that they don't have. You're living in a hut in Africa, but you have access to social media. You have access to the internet through your phone. And right. you begin to see how, how the, the inequality and meanwhile, inequality is increasing. It was increasing in the 20s. It was increasing in the 2010s. In an unstable global order, just as we had in the 20s. Yeah, it's in fact. You want, to, you want to clamp down on it and go back to something simpler. And the simplest thing is an authoritarian society with an authoritarian state, with an authoritarian head of the household. Hmm. And that urge to go back to patriarchy. Yeah, and I think that is a powerful urge, and I think it explains a lot of what we're seeing. Um, Stephen Pinker's fascinating, and he, you know, he's all these statistics showing how our lives have improved objectively. And yet, when I look at that, it's like our subjective experience. You know, when we look at the realm of our psychology, our spirituality, our our sense of belonging, of community, of, of living a meaningful life. Like that is something that you can't measure with a number really, or maybe you could, but it definitely hasn't improved generally speaking. And, you know, we have skyrocketing rates of addiction and suicide and, and all that. But it, it's, so it's like the inequality, even if everyone is much wealthier than we were a hundred years ago, 
because of the massive inequality, we don't feel that. And because of our hyper-competitive, capitalist, individualized world, it's go, go, go. It's never enough. You're never good enough. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but it's like our subjective experience isn't matching what should be, what maybe we should be feeling objectively. So that's, that's one issue. And then I think um, Absolutely. When, we, when we look at Trump, it's like part of what I see is I always look to it. I think the world in general looked to America as a leader, you know, morally, like we had Martin Luther King, we had the civil rights movement, we had, we've always been a flawed country, but we've been a leader of this idea of moral progress, I think. And now we have a leader in the White House who doesn't seem to care about that at all. And it's just been very disconcerting. And um, I, I can't imagine, you know, it's hard for me to even contemplate the effects that might have on other countries and people around the world where it's like, oh, maybe we can all just be selfish. We can all just, you know, America first. Well, what about Germany first or where, whatever country you're in first? And Absolutely. Um, it's scary. It's scary to contemplate a world where we're returning to that kind of mentality on a mass scale. Well, the United States was the first large scale constitutional democracy in the modern world. You, you, you had something similar starting up in the UK, but nothing on, on this scale. The, the size of the United States and the level of participation um, when we began was like nothing the world had ever seen, um, and but particularly nothing in the modern world. And then you had the French Revolution, and it looked like that was starting up there, but it all fell apart in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a slow build up to democracy. But the United States was leading the world. And it wasn't just a democratic political system. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville comments in the early 1830s that, that democracy is laced throughout the society. We had to build all of these institutions from the ground up. Every place settlers would go, they'd have to start all of their institutions afresh, including their city governments, including their county governments, including their state governments. Now, all of this was built on the, on the graves of Native Americans and on the backs of African Americans mm. working as slaves. So we had this heavy shadow that we always carried with us that blew us apart in the Civil War. But then World War I comes along. And at the end of it, our president is declaring that democracy is the norm, that all of these European colonies should be freed. Mm. And so we go promoting it in, in a number of empires that collapse at the time, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Habsburg Empire. When these collapse, we try to create democracies. And then the same thing happens after World War II where we try to create these democracies. And the same thing happens after 1989. All the while, we're, we're hypocritical. We're subver subverting um, the sovereignty of numerous nations. We're subverting democracies occasionally where we don't like it. The far left tends to exaggerate how much it happened. There's really yeah. three big instances of that um, that we should just name to sort of set it aside in Iran in 53, in Guatemala in 54, in Chile in 73, right. um, where we overthrew democratic governments um, in the Cold War. But the general impetus has been the United States is this powerful democracy. We've got this heavy duty shadow we, we, that we haven't ever fully come to terms with. And we're hypocritical, but at the same time, we're out there promoting democracy. And this yeah. helped establish a world in which roughly half the countries were democratic around 2016 when Trump's elected to office. Now, all of that is thrown into question. The world order was already shaky. American power in the world was already questionable. Europe and America together and all the other developed democracies relative to these rising middle-income countries, um, we were weaker. And that meant there was more competition in the global order. There was likely to be more nationalism. Um, now into this step, a bunch of nationalist leaders, it's all over the world now. And not just nationalist leaders, far right nationalist leaders with many fascist elements to their leadership styles that are grappling with all the same problems that America didn't come to grips with. So you've got Bolsonaro in Brazil, Modi in India, 
Xi Jinping in China, um, Putin in Russia, and then you have all these lesser the guy in the Philippines. Leaders. leaders. Duterte in the Philippines is the most exemplary, <laughs> exemplary <laughs> fascist of them all. Netanyahu in Israel, Assad in Syria. Um, you have so many now. I, I don't have time to name them all, but that, that's those are the big ones that you tend to think of. And they all have the um, right-wing nationalists with fascist elements, their administrations. Now, they're all in competition for power. And the United States has not only pulled itself out of the world, but it's begun supporting autocracies. The focus is a support for autocracies. And that's like something the world has never seen. We had a global order that was generally held together by developed democracies. But that order is almost completely broken. Oh, so I mean, it's, yeah. It's amazing to hear you summarize that and to tie it into this global thing. Like instead of fixating just on Trump, we have a global phenomena of right wing populist strongmen, basically, with yeah. elements of fascism like you're talking about. And so part of the radicalness of the Trump administration is is it's not like he's gotten rid of the global order, but he's radically changed it and radically changed America's place in it. And um, I just, that's just fascinating to me. I mean, this, these kinds of impacts, it's going to have impacts for years to come, whatever happens in our November election. Yeah. It's possible that if Biden is elected and he's able to hold, he's able to keep from his election being stolen, particularly by the Supreme Court, which is, there's great likelihood that the, that the election will be contested, even though Biden wins it and will go to the Supreme Court and they'll make a partisan decision like they did in 2000, but even worse, and give it to Trump. But let's say he's elected and he gets in office. Now, it's possible that because of COVID and the economic collapse and the terrible management of COVID in countries like Brazil, Russia, and India, which have the highest infection rates of all countries, um, which just happen to be led by complete fascists. Um, now, it's possible that some of these leaders will begin to fall as a result, and that Biden will usher in a new wave of a different kind of leaders, and will begin to try to preserve some of that global order. But we're still in a position where we now are living in a multipolar world with multiple sources of power. And China is there saying, put me in, coach. I want to be the new imperialist. Mm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and Putin is saying, screw this thing. If the global order works and if democracy thrives in it, I'm the bad guy. So I want to blow the whole thing up, mm. which he's been trying to do since possibly as far back as 2009, but with, in a very concerted effort since 2014 when he broke all precedent outside of Saddam Hussein in the last two generations and took the Crimea from Ukraine. That just doesn't happen in the world. Right. That set off something very insane, which is a major country just stole a territory. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like Putin's a really bad actor um, wanting to, like you said, blow up democracy. It's like, get rid of them. Like <laughs> He sees the kind of liberalized... Western democratic thing as a, as a threat. So, I mean, and listening to you, like you're in favor of that, like the global order, we haven't even talked about like the United Nations. I mean, these are all such big topics, but basically the idea that democracy for all its flaws is better than most of the alternatives or maybe all the alternatives that we've seen. And so it's something worth supporting. Liberal democracies are good. Human rights are good. The United Nations, like it's an idea worth believing in as far as I'm concerned and like creating a functioning global order that prevents war and increases our prosperity. It'd be hard to like logically argue against these things. And yet we're moving in the opposite direction, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you look to the whole of the world, the 21st century is defined by its global challenges, climate change, always, always since the early fifties, the threat that the U S and Russia or the U S and China or China and Russia will get in a nuclear war and just, blow the roof off of everything. It's always been there. Overpopulation, the death of the oceans, it's all global issues. Um, food security on a global level, which is a global issue. And then you have this whole sort of minor cast of characters, failed states, the sex trade, the drug trade, the global, global terrorism. 
And all of this stuff has become increasingly globalized as it's become easier to move money, to move goods, to move information from place to place. Um, so now we have this globalized world, but we have even less of a functioning global order. It wasn't like the other order was so functional, but it's far less so now. Right. I mean, it's, and when you were talking about the hypocrisy of the United States, which the left always brings up and perhaps exaggerates and blah, blah, blah. But like, when I hear about that, it's like the answer is not to uh, get rid of democracy and, you know, forget about the global order. The answer is to get rid of the hypocrisy to like face our shadow rather than it's like we've been taken over by the shadow instead of confronting it and working through it. Absolutely. The answer would have been that when Obama came to office, he tried to, he tried to expand the UN Security Council. So the UN Security Council is made up of those nations that won in World War II. China, Russia, mm. the UK, France, the US. We have a veto on any major things that happen through the UN. So if we're not working together, the UN becomes dysfunctional, as it has been for many decades of its existence, just completely dysfunctional. Um, so the ideal would have been that we would have expanded that to emerging democracies like India, like Turkey, like Brazil. Mm. Uh, like South Africa. But now, just flip forward a little further, and these democracies are degenerating, most of them into fascism mm. or oligarchy um, or some combination or some form of authoritarianism. Or the best we could say about it is this is a right wing populism that's completely unstable. So we don't really have the option to expand the global order to functioning states because. The states that made up the global order are degenerating and becoming hyper-nationalistic. Uh, I'm afraid you're, you're painting a very pessimistic picture here. So bleak. It's, uh, it's bleak. bleak. And it's unbelievably bleak. Um, and on that larger global scale, it's harder to find answers, but it's never like we controlled the world. Mm. So we're going to have global consciousness. Global consciousness is there. Virtually everyone in the world today knows that we live on a rounded planet, that the rounded planet has oceans and an atmosphere, and that goods circulate around it, that people circulate around it, that waste circulate around it, mm. that we can wipe ourselves out with nuclear war, that there's some kind of cl climatic disasters that we could have, mm. that the planet warms and cools as a whole. Even the people who are climate deniers typically recognize some role of the biosphere in regulating temperature, the educated ones at least, the, that are really hammering away at climate change being something real. The, we know all of these things. We know that immigrants move from country to country. We know that there's a global, um, that there's global capital flowing from country to country. We can imagine a world. And so in imagining a world, we have solutions that come from nations. So even if we don't have a bunch of nation states cooperating with one another, we still have it coming from the bottom up. We still have Germans and French and Americans mm -hmm. and Indians and Brazilians taking global action, which I is why the Brazilians haven't destroyed the Amazon yet. That's, because probably half the country is desperately trying to preserve it for the rest of us. That's beautiful. Yeah. So, the, I mean, there's, that's a positive note, right? There's the, age of information, like there's more access to all this information than ever before. So it's possible to have an optimistic outlook. Um, maybe in the long run, our global consciousness will rise or raise, so to speak. Um, well, I kind of want to, he told me not to ask you this at the beginning and now it's maybe near the end, but like, <laughs> you want to define fascism and, and speak more specifically to Trump and I guess how, I guess my question at the moment is like, you know, when people voted for Trump in 2016, I don't know how many of them knew what they were voting for other than a rejection of the, the norm, right? Like they wanted something different. They felt left out. Maybe they, they didn't like Hillary Clinton for whatever reasons. And I'm sure sexism played a role in that, but there was also just a rejection of this kind of globalism and um, I don't know if there's a lot of thought of what should replace it. And I'm, I'm really curious what will happen this November if America en masse will reject Trump or it'll be a really close election. But how do you, yeah, just throw that your way and see how you. 
Let's build up to the definition from the ground up. Let's look at why people voted for Trump. And we've got a number of um, a number of ideas that have been set forth by people. Right. Some people, particularly the far left, um, often the progressive left, will say that people voted for Trump because they were sick of the neoliberals. Right. They were sick of the oligarchy. They were sick of the inequality, and they wanted to they wanted to get back at it in some way. So then let's go to the global level. So was it neoliberal? Did fascists rise to power under neoliberal governments? Not in Brazil, the most, maybe the most fascist leader in the world. He competes with Duterte in the Philippines. Um, Bolsonaro, who, um, who once said to a, a, another um, fellow politician, you're too ugly for me to rape. <laughs> this is the yeah, modern- wow. <laughs> He's declared a war on the indigenous people of the Amazon and the Amazon itself, who, which he wants to develop. He has no conception of what this would do to the planet. Um, mm-hmm. He says that the, the military dictatorship of the 60s was, um, was uh, not brutal enough. They only tortured pe- th- their political opponents. They should have killed them. So, so let, me, let me pause you here. So this guy is saying all this terrible stuff and people voted for him, right? Or is this yes. a surprise? He power after the most successful social democratic movement in the developing world in recent decades that held power for quite a long time. It was quite corrupt. That was the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, India, Modi, you have another fascist leader. I won't go into it because it will take too long to go into each of them. But you have another one who comes after a corrupt social democratic party. You have massive fascist movements in Germany where they're now worried about neo-Nazi um, conspiracies to overthrow the government in Sweden, um, two highly socially democratic states. Now they haven't encountered quite a bit of neoliberalism, but they've maintained their relatively strong social safety nets. But they also have fascism. They didn't get fascist governments, but they came damn close, as did France. Now you look to the former Soviet Union states, you, you, the former states of the Soviet Union, you find that the ones that were least hit by neoliberalism, that fared the best through privatization through the 90s, Poland and Hungary, became the most fascist. So I reject that out of hand, as did most of the scholars of fascism who studied the rise of fascism in the 20s and 30s throughout Europe, that this was the left gravitated toward this explanation, but it wasn't the case. Interesting. Yeah. You have another one that they just hate liberals. They're looking for someone that can just attack liberals. Hmm. But does Trump really do a good job of it? Trump's an idiot. He's not clever. He's not witty. He doesn't talk fast. He doesn't justify his arguments well. He doesn't make conservatives look good in relation to liberals. He's not, really, he's not really philosophical. He doesn't really have a coherent worldview. that he's sort of- get whatsoever. He's completely dysfunctional, utter embarrassment to them. Meanwhile, they had better bullies they could have chosen. Ted Cruz is a smart bully. Paul Ryan, is, he's clever. He's, he's sharp. He looks so sharp. He's less insulting. Newt Gingrich knows how to, how to put us down like, like nobody's business. They could have chosen a right-wing talk show host. There's so many people they could have chosen, but they chose a complete slob. And you find this in one country after another. They weren't looking for someone who could put us down well. It had to be something else. So why choose in one country after another these complete idiot slobs, these these inarticulate morons who their own advisors suggest, as as several have of Trump, that he has the intelligence of a fifth grader, Um, but they're hateful and they band people together around it. And so what I propose is that they actually are looking for someone who makes them feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you have to choose someone who's as inarticulate as yourself. Mm-hmm. who's as dysfunctional as yourself, who is, is incapable of functioning in the information age society that's so complex that requires such nuance and such intelligence to maneuver through that, that has responded to that world the way we all want to when we fall apart. It's not as if we here are so functional and it's not as if all of our listeners are doing so well with it, mm. but they've given up on it. They want to give up on it and cut the whole thing off. In, in the charade of trying to debate liberals, they're always going to lose if they debate with truth and facts and reason. In, in that charade. And so, 
<laughs> Here's where fascism gets so interesting. So now I'll define it. So fascism is always a number of things. It's racist, it's sexist, it's populist, it's militarist, it's nationalist, and it's authoritarian. It always involves a cult of personality centered around a big man, strong man leader, who enforces his propaganda and his lies, or enforces his lies with propaganda, and he punishes dissenters in the end group. And so this cult tends to grow ever more devoted as they close themselves off to other sources of information. And they juxtapose themselves against an outgroup. The outgroup could be any weak or marginalized minority, anybody that they can feel strong and good about themselves bullying. Now, this in group's almost always an ethnic majority who finds its role threatened in some way. Maybe they're threatened by the rising power of women or homosexuals or the bourgeois or progressives or socialists or communists or black people or brown people of some sort. Um, and they want to get theirs and they want to reinforce this sense of a great nation. And they also have nihilistic urges. All of the fascist movements are in some way nihilistic. They get yeah. off on attacking things, on tearing things down. So this is always going to be social norms. They're not conservative because they attack social norms. They attack established institutions. Conservatives wouldn't do that. Conservatives would want to preserve these things. They'd want to preserve decorum, basic decency, at least some semblance of it. They might not always be so true to it. They might lie about it. They might be corrupt, but they're going to want to preserve these things. They might be uncomfortable with democracy, but in an established democracy, conservatives aren't going to attack it. They're going to worship the Constitution, and they might get it a little bit wrong. They might simplify it. So they're anti-liberal, they're anti-socialist, they're anti-feminist, they're anti-conservative. Yeah. All these things. And so you get this great forcefulness and they, they try to, they want to be strong and to bully. So George Orwell summed up, a fascist is simply a bully. Hmm. We can get more complex simple, about Simple it. definition. <laughs> yeah. It's a bully. Yeah. And part of, what I, part of what I just heard you say is a bully in Trump who makes many people feel better about themselves. I thought that was an interesting point. A uh, nihilistic bully living in a fantasy world. That's another way to put it. Yeah, the role of fantasy rather than medium with reality, which isn't sustainable. And it's scary. And I think the nihilism is scary. This impulse to destroy or to not care or to not maybe do the work on yourself or to have to think about difficult things. It's like this kind of easy way out. I think that there's truth to that. And there are very obviously intelligent conservative thinkers that I respect. Um, and a lot of them hate Trump, obviously, maybe all of them. So it's not like what I'm hearing you say too. It's not like liberal versus conservative. Like this is like a new phenomena. You're talking about fascism. You're talking about a bully. You're not talking about a debate between preserving the social order or liberalizing, you know, things. It's like something new that came along. And I think when you listed those other politicians who, who could have gotten the nomination, like, you know, what is it? Ted Cruz or whoever. It's like, I have this visceral reaction against them. Like they're, they just, they're like the quote unquote establishment. And I think what Trump offered was something so different. Yeah. And you're saying that people didn't vote for him because they hated liberals. But I think, I don't know. I, I still think there's truth to like, it was wanting something different. Like it's, it came outside of the box, you know, it was, yeah. Yeah. They hated liberals. They hated our smug attitudes. They hated the way we would analyze them, psychoanalyze them like I'm doing right now. They hated our, our urban multiculturalism um, that they never could really make sense of. Um, they hated the way we fetishized new moral um, positions. I remember when um, they tried to outlaw, um, when the... Republican legislature in North Carolina um, tried, to, oh, I can't even remember exactly what they did with um, the trans bathrooms, um, that you had to, um, <laughs> that you had to go, oh, God, it didn't make any sense to me because the Republican male legislators wanted the, the male to female trans women to be in their bathrooms, which I always found um, quite ironic how it all came out because you have to go to the bathroom of your, your birth-based sex. 
But this issue just busts open onto the scene. Yeah. No liberals have given it any consideration whatsoever. No debate about it. There, we hardly have given it a thought. Trans rights issues have been on the back burner of identity politics for decades, and only the most sophisticated people have really thought through them. But all of a sudden, we expected everyone across the country, within a matter of weeks, maybe months, to have developed and refined positions, and this is what they hate. Mm. Well, and they so hate- that's, that's a legitimate they- criticism of the left, and that was a, another place I wanted to go in this conversation. It's a whole other topic, but like some of the you know, stuff on the very far left, like Antifa and some of the um, calling everyone a racist, like like it has its own extremism that I've been exposed to more than in my personal life, more than the extreme right. And it's like, you know, I think that there are fascist elements on the far left as well, just to simplify it. So I'll I'll go through all that list and we can, we can think about how it fits on, on the far left. Um, Racist. Rarely do you see racism on the far left. Um, Mm. Sexist. Very little sexism. I mean, you'll get sexism, but it's it's basically unconscious sexism, unconscious racism. And when it's pointed out, it tends to be worked with and majorities oppose it, strong majorities oppose it. Um, Populist. You do get populism. Um, Mm. But look who we band around. Bernie Sanders is a highly intelligent, highly um, experienced politician. He has well thought out policies. Same thing with Jeremy Corbyn in the UK. Mm. The populist leaders that we tend to band around outside of Latin America, which is a totally different story, um, which does tend to have a know nothing populist left with strong authoritarian tendencies, which we could get into. Um, I consider them a major exception. Um, but in, in, the United States, in Europe, across the Middle East, East Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, the left doesn't, doesn't have a, a know-nothing populism. Mm. Uh, it doesn't have strong traditions of authoritarianism. The worst that you see in Antifa is not authoritarian. It's a lack of any order whatsoever. Right. You see on college campuses of trying to shut down conservative speakers isn't authoritarianism. It might be political correctness run amok. Oftentimes, I think it's right on. I mean, oftentimes they're shutting down propagandists and idiots. Now, occasionally that's going to extend to highly intelligent professors who have something very interesting to say about conservatism that touched on something structurally racist through their career um, that was, that's a major threat. I think of Charles Murray. Charles Murray, as, yeah as a great example of this. I mean, he has important things that need to be heard and he had hardcore racist stuff that he tried. I think he tried to overcome in his later writings, but Hmm. you're going to see this kind of attack on these sorts of individuals, which are respected, highly prolific professors. And that's different, but usually it's more people like um, Milo Yiannopoulos, who is basically a Twitter troll who terrorize people, someone I know very well, he went after their children. Oh God. Um, you know, so uh, he, he had it hundreds of thousands of people like going after their children. I mean, these are like terrible mm. people that have been protested. So you don't tend to have the authoritarianism. You don't have hyper-nationalism. None of that on the left. The cult of personality. Um, well, yes, you'll get a cult, cult of personality. You tend to get that in any kind of political movement where you have great leaders. You get a little more of that in the progressive left these days. Um, but as soon as they step out of line, as soon as they lie, as soon as they do something unjust um, or even just unkind, they hammer them. Mm. So you, I mean, you see more accountability happening. Oh, my God. The, I mean, so many people on the... on. Uh, so many people in Bernie's movement wouldn't even accept him after he came out in support of, of Hillary, which I personally found absurd. Mm. Um, but, but they weren't, they weren't going to stick with him through the end. You don't get that. You don't get nihilism. You right. get nihilism on the far extreme Antifa anarchist black block demonstrator left, not black lives matter, a certain form of punk, almost always white from what I've seen demonstrations that was right. prevalent from the early 2000s up to the rise of Antifa. Um, so you're going to get that, but 
who, what national leader, what national commentator, what major author supports these people? Well, so, I, so I, can't single, I can't think of a single one. Not a single congressional representative supports these people. Ilhan Omar slammed the people engaged in property destruction hmm. when, it, when it began in, in uh, Minneapolis. Yeah, so I think those are really good points. And maybe part of what gives the right-wing populace their power is a more cohesive base of support. Like the cult of personality is so much simpler. You just support, maybe he says one thing one day and a different, totally different thing the next day, but they just somehow go along with it. And the left lacks that kind of unity. And so they keep losing elections over and over. And if you put your ideals above the practicalities and it costs you an election, maybe you feel like you've been you know, have some moral integrity there, but you've also failed to make any changes. You're not in office. You're, <laughs> I just see yeah. the left losing over and over again. And I'm worried about this election being another terrible example. Well, the far left in developed democratic states virtually always loses. Maybe there's an exception in France or Italy. Um, now, you get more of a sort of moderate social democratic, which in the U.S. would be far left, but its tone is very different in Europe. You'll get, you'll get social democrats. Now, they'll win, but they tend to be gentle. They tend to want to build consensus. They want to work with the opposition. In, in Europe, what, what really got their social safety net legislation after World War II was usually coalitions of social democrats and center-right, actually religious parties. Christian Democrats. Um, they went by various different names um, that were opposed to fascism, that had conservative elements to them, but wanted a stronger social safety net as well. Um, so you, there's a very different tone, and these people will win. The problem is when, when the center left or the left, broadly speaking, turn to something like neoliberalism, turn to a sort of much more market based um, system that began. Mm -hmm privatizing a lot of public assets in the throughout the late 80s, 90s, early 2000s. But I think this has been exaggerated by the far left. Mm. Part of the problem is they lack access to power. And that's a problem of oligarchy, which is tied to inequality. But it's also directly related to the Supreme Court having blown open um, the flood of cash. Yes, that's a huge, huge issue. issue. I appreciate that in your book. I think that's one of the biggest things that's corrupted our entire country and led to Trump was like all the money in our politics. Absolutely. But that was all Republican appointed justices. Wow. That's terrible. Republicans almost to a person are opposed to campaign finance reform in any meaningful way. Democrats almost to a person are strongly in favor of um, strong camp campaign finance reform. I can't Republican. believe that it's not a bigger issue that's being talked about, and I can't believe that it's not a bipartisan issue. It just seems so obvious. Like having all this money from corporations flood our political system. I mean, it's well, been a disaster. No, Republicans are opposed to the flood of money in the system. This is an interesting thing. But then when it comes to actually enacting the legislation, I should have said Republican legislators almost to a person are opposed. Hmm. Now, 80% of the population last I looked, or 82% or something, maybe it was several years ago, was opposed to the Citizens United decision. Uh, so this is such a great example of the failure of our democracy. If you have 80% of the people in a democracy opposing this idiotic system, and yet no meaningful change can make, can be made, like the, it's so dysfunctional, right? 80% of the Republicans, let alone the Democrats, I mean, so... I mean, basically, we have a democratic system, which you, sh you should always expect a little corruption in any political system, that became immensely corrupt through campaign, con campaign contributions and from the revolving door of, of politicians becoming lobbyists and lobbyists heading major bureaus, um, which became less and less accessible. But now with Trump, that's exploded. Uh. It's, it's been taken to a whole new level. So, of course, he didn't drain the swamp as, as he promised to do. What's interesting about that is his supporters didn't really care that he didn't drain the swamp. I can't think of a single time they've expressed regrets around that. They didn't care that he created a cabinet of billionaires. They don't care that he's profiting off of his position or he's trying as, as hard as he can to profit off of it. These aren't things that concern them. About the only thing that really dented his 
his favorability ratings was separating children from their parents at the border. Oh, God. Which most people think stopped, but it didn't actually stop. It continued. Um, and and it has, in many ways, our treatment of migrants has gotten worse, but that's another story. Well, I mean, on that note, do you see, like people use the word concentration camp. Do you think that's an exaggeration? Do you, like, what is the, do you have any words on that situation in the border? Because that's been hard to know what the facts are. So, so let's, let's look at the, what, what we were seeing when it was a major issue. What we were seeing was um, people jam-packed into cells. There was barely room to um, sit. You had a place you could lie down. They, had, they were given tinfoil sheets. Toddlers were oftentimes put in there without their parents, running around. So you had 11-year-olds caring for toddlers in jam-packed prison cells of children. And now you had these, these were off, they were private. They were privately owned. So you had a corporation that was profiting from keeping their expenses down. They didn't give them shampoo. They didn't give them toothpaste. They didn't allow them to shower all the time. They didn't give them flu shots. Um, now, all of this was argued for in defense of not giving these things in court by Trump representatives of the Trump administration. So it was a concerted effort. They tried not to give them toothpaste. They argued they didn't have to. It wasn't a basic human right. They didn't have to give them shampoo. Um, they, so now we had this scattered across the country. It's a persecuted group that the president regular, routinely attacks. He refers to them as snakes. Now, in Georgia, there's at least one facility where a doctor is systematically giving the women hysterectomies so they can't have children. Um, every woman who comes and sees them gets a hysterectomy. Um, this is according to one whistleblower. It's not the kind of thing people make up. No. Whistleblowers rarely make things up. Um, who knows how many other facilities this is happening? It's been corroborated by a number of other people in it. This is concentration camps. It's not Nazi death camps. Mm. Concentration camps all over the world. Chinese have their own concentration camps in the Xinjiang province where they put Uyghurs in to re-educate them, mm. where they've separated them from their families, um, where they're also put in inhumane conditions. So they're, they're clearly... I mean, you're, and you're connecting it with fascism and that this is this persecuted group that's kind of blamed for things. And, and it's not the same as what the Nazis were doing in that they're, were, you know, they're not being taken out and shot or put in mass graves, but it's clearly a mass human rights violation and it's wrong. So there's... But bear in mind, we're all, when this stuff started coming out, we were only three years in. The mass hysterectomies have started four years in. Now, where were the Nazis? Yeah, that's, that's new to me that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You almost no one knows about it. You can't keep you can't keep track of the horrible things that the Trump administration is doing. In just the last few days, I found out about the mass hysterectomies. Last week, the mass hysterectomies taking place in one of these camps um, that the Trump administration pushed to use a heat ray that makes the skin feel like it's burning off on protesters in front of the White House. Um, in the beginning of the big Black Lives Matter protests. Um, this has come out. They wouldn't use it in Iraq um, because they deemed it a, a torture device, but Trump wanted to use it or the administration wanted to use it against protesters. Um, so oh, I think just, in, just today, this is just, we can't keep up with this stuff. Just today, I found out that he recently gave a speech where he told people they had good genes. You all have got the good genes. We've got the good genes. We've got to keep out the people with the bad genes. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, the only commentary I saw on it was a historian of Nazi Germany who said this is exactly what Hitler was doing. Now, in 37, the Nazis hadn't gone to war yet. Okay, they were doing a little in Spain, but they hadn't initiated the conflict. In 37, most Germans thought that Hitler would keep them out of war. In 37, the concentration camps weren't death camps. Communists had been put there. Homosexuals had been put there. Um, some disabled people had been put there. There was a lot of protest against that. Um, but for the most part, you didn't have anything looking at all like death camps. That didn't start up until 
roughly a decade into Hitler's time in office. Mm. Give Trump a decade. We'll be shocked. Already, he's taken Yemen through significant arms and logistical support to the Saudis, 18 million people to the brink of famine, the world's worst humanitarian crisis. The Saudis have blockaded the country. They bombed critical infrastructure. They bombed the ports. Um, We've known this since Obama was just leaving office and he was trying to wrap it up. Mm. He was curtailing the arms sales. He was curtailing the logistical support. Trump stepped it up, intensified it. Well, this is just a very sobering thing. I mean, so for you, when you look at, if you want to face the reality of what Trump is and who he is, you're, you're painting a very grim picture that I imagine most of his supporters wouldn't believe, or most people don't want to believe even on the left. Um, but you're, you're saying that, so what, if he gets reelected for four more years, you, you have a pretty negative, I mean, obviously view of what would, where this is all going. So let me just say, I was one of the very few people to predict before he was elected that if he were elected, we would have concentration camps on the border. Um, we would of course have, um, a mass cleansing of, um, immigrants, um, something that was incredibly brutal and shocking. Um, I hypothesized many things around it. I predicted that Yemen would begin to starve, um, that there'd be mass starvation in Yemen. We don't know how many people have died. COVID has in- intensified that. Somehow the humanitarian organizations have kept them from dying, but um, a number of people in the United Nations have begun saying that at a certain point in 2018, that it was the worst famine we'd seen in generations. Mm-hmm. One, one person said the worst in 100 years, but that wasn't actually accurate. Um, but you began seeing statements like that. Um, I predicted that he would um, consolidate power within the Republican Party, that the resistance would end within the Republican Party. You initially saw great resistance among, among senators like John McCain and Jeff Flake mm-hmm. and... Um, guy whose name sounds like Cory Booker, um, Bob Corker. (laughs) 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 The mirror of Cory Booker. Didn't Um, Romney speak out a little bit? Romney was speaking out more, but now Romney is going to support um, Trump's pick for the um, Supreme Court, Hmm. whose cult that she's a part of, uh, The Handmaid's Tale, um, was based off of the cult that this woman is a part of. Are you, um, are you serious? I, I've, that is one of the most terrifying shows. And I've been thinking about that show when I was reading your book and it's, uh, there's really something there. Like it's, it's, an, it's possible to imagine a reality like that. And that scares the hell out of me. His choice for the Supreme court is a part of a small sect that many people have called a cult. That was probably the basis of the handmaid's tale it's not absolutely sure. Um, they called their women handmaids. Got they stopped it. calling them handmaids after it came out. So that was also, just found that out today. It's so bad when you add it all up. You have to have a good memory and keep referring back. Notice how we haven't even mentioned him inviting Putin to interfere in our elections. Mm. Notice how we haven't even touched on the impeachment. So, so I, I predicted these things. I predicted that he would assault the courts he would carry out an assault on the courts and the media, and he would try to shut down critical media organizations. He would fully consolidate power in the Republican Party. It would become increasingly intense and brutal what he was carrying out, that we'd see the loss of a, roughly a dozen democracies in the world. In many ways, we've seen worse. In some ways, it's very hard to measure, and I recognize that, that, that at the time. And the other things was crimes against humanity would explode. Almost immediately after he came to office, you saw a genocide in Burma against the Rohingya minority. You've seen a cultural genocide against the Uyghurs in China. You've seen mass crimes against humanity against Palestinian demonstrators where thousands upon thousands have been shot on the Gaza border, uh, many children in the head. Um, You've seen crimes against humanity intensify in Syria, carried out by Assad and Putin. And of course, there's Yemen. So, and then there's Brazil in the Amazon. So, shocking level of crimes against humanity. Now, what comes next? All of that is going to be intensified. The assault on democratic institutions will be intensified. You'll see more voter rolls purged. 
you'll see more gerrymandering of districts to keep um, Republicans, at, uh, Democrats out of the House. Um, you'll see more stolen elections, um, as we saw in Georgia um, in the midterm election. You'll see more of those happening in states. Um, you'll see the Supreme Court overruling more and more legislation that Democrats have passed with no precedent, um, no precedent for it. And you'll see Trump's rhetoric become more insane, more violent towards the opposition. Already in the springtime, he said the only good Democrat's a dead Democrat. That was in a, the first line of a video that he tweeted. Um, you'll see more of those kinds of statements. Jeez. You'll see greater brutality within the concentration camps, more things like the mass hysterectomies, more shutting down of free speech. Uh, so I could go on about these things. And the crimes against humanity will be shocking. Mm. So shocking all over the world. Yeah, I don't even know what to say to all that. <laughs> Vote. <laughs> Vote like your life depends on it. And do everything you can to get everyone you know to vote. I mean, I can't, I, I don't believe that the majority of people that will eventually most likely end up casting their ballot for Trump and for the Republicans are imagining or supporting what you're describing, even if that is the reality. So I think maybe that role of fantasy or um, it's just, or confusion or the conspiracy theories. And I, I think the role of having a small group of very committed, very well-organized people with a long-term vision, like the evangelical far right Christians kind of stalking the Supreme court. Like, I think we can't, we need to like look at these things and take them seriously. Like they have this long-term game plan of uh, like exactly like a handmaiden's tale. And so it's, it's not like some wild fantasy. It's something to like actually confront and talk about. Yeah. Once you start looking at genocide, you begin to see how people ignore the worst crimes that are being committed in the world. You begin to, denialism becomes, starts to look like the norm. So I wrote my last book before this on the, the dynamics of collective trauma around how we face genocide. I called it the Holocaust we all deny. Mm. Um, so you begin to see there's this massive shadow and this, there are these movements that arise where people unleash the id, they unleash all of their worst impulses and, and the least virtuous person becomes the most powerful. And this happens periodically, and you begin to see the structure of that. You begin to see how, how democratic systems can be worn down and authoritarians take power, and they make it look like a democracy, but it's not. It's actually an authoritarian system. And they continue holding elections, but the elections are a show, as mm -hmm. we see in Russia now, to, to mm -hmm. give a, um, um, an example that almost everybody would accept at this stage. Yeah. Um, and you begin to get eyes for how this could happen in your, in your own place. And then you start looking at things like hmm, all those environmentalists that, that saw that famine, they said, well, you know, we're overpopulated. And then, you know, we're overpopulated. We really can't do anything about this. And they're countered, the, their statement is countered with, but you know that people in the most overpopulated places actually have the most, they continue having the most children and they have more children in famines and they have more children in refugee camps. Be, there's certain dynamics that come into play. And so in supporting these things, you're not actually reducing population and they don't listen. You see these, you see these kinds of things. It, it, that's a very normal thing on the environmental left. And none of these people are going to support a genocide. They kind of are. That's interesting. It, 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 it makes it, me think it of uh, the shadow. Like it's coming out of the shadow. It's something we yeah. don't want to look at or face. Or... Absolutely. But we, we've got genocidal impulses. I guarantee you think back on all your actions, any, anyone listening, you'll find times where you justified mass death on a mass scale that will shock you. Um, like just in your own mind, like the thoughts you're having, or the mind, but, but also politically, you might've taken a stand in favor of it, mm. particularly if you're inv an environmentalist, but you might've done it in supporting a war against a bad guy at some point in your life, mm. a, a, a war that involved mass slaughter or in opposing a war that was about shutting down a genocide because we didn't, you, and you use the argument that we didn't want any American troops killed in Bosnia. <laughs> 
Mm. Now, if you use that argument, you were supporting a gen- you were supporting allowing a genocide to continue, right? In order to not lose any American life, it was just a bad argument, and it wound up that we actually eventually, after several years, shut down a genocide in Bosnia without losing any lives, out without losing any of the people shutting it down. Mm. But you start to get an eye for this stuff, the deep shadow, the deep collective shadow. Yeah. Well, do you have, um, I know I've taken up far too much of your time here. <laughs> I wonder if we could end on something of a positive note um, in terms of all the political situations we're talking about. How do you feel about Biden? How do you, like, what is a more positive path that, that could unfold here? So, so I was a strong Bernie supporter, um, got strong progressive roots, but there's a good place on every point on the political spectrum has got some positive manifestation of it. I don't really know if fascism actually is even on the spectrum. It's, it's its own kind of thing, but Mm. Biden's a moderate. Biden has gone a long ways towards taking on many of the aspects of Bernie's platform. Um, $15 an hour minimum wage, basically free college tuition for all over a trillion dollars that he would put into combating climate change. He'd bring empathy to the office, or if you don't believe he's truly empathetic, he'd at least believe, bring an image of empathy, a focus on understanding. Um, He's supportive of a multicultural movement. He's also included the center right, the people who rejected Trump. So it's a massive coalition. It's always going to be contentious. It's always going to be hard to control. There's something really beautiful about that. And at any point in history, you never know what's just going to click the whole thing and change it. Mm. All of this horrible stuff I've talked about could reverse itself overnight, could have already kicked in in the process. We might look back several years from now and say, that event that happened, those Black Lives Matter protests were actually the turning point. Mm. Didn't know it. And we might also look in the broad scheme of history that this was a sort of last gasp of a drowning man, and that drowning man being um, these authoritarian, nationalistic, patriarchal societies, that we might be moving into something much more expansive. So we just don't know. There's a, there's a great threat out there, but we just don't know. And we can turn the course of history, each of us and all of us together. Yeah, it's fascinating to think about the meaning that we give things in the bigger scheme. and how much hinges on this election. Um, so hopefully that will be the case. Hopefully this will be an anomaly and we can move forward in a more positive way. <laughs> and, uh, I hope so, because my worst vision is quite terrible. But I, I also hope that people take what you're talking about more seriously. And there's been a dismissive attitude, like no one or few people want to come out and say Trump is a fascist and talk about it in these terms. And I think I appreciate your book explicitly doing that. And the, these are things worth thinking about, worth taking seriously and worth like having mornings about, you know, like it's, Absolutely. it's really messing with fire here. Absolutely. This is probably as Noam Chomsky has put it, probably the most critical election in human history. Well, oh. it's Noam Chomsky. who's not going to support a moderate Biden. who's not going to be a strong supporter of the Democrats right. from the far left where they tend to downplay how bad Trump is and saying that's all, that's all window dressing. All of those offensive things he said, that's not really the core stuff. Mm. Yeah. That's a significant uh, point because Chomsky and the far left would, you know, say that, Oh, you know, right or left, it doesn't really matter. You know, two puppets of the same hand or, or whatever the same is. Um, but with Trump, it's something different. And um, hopefully people will, will listen to that. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for being on the podcast. I know it went longer than, than planned, but it was, it was a rich <laughs> conversation and a wake-up call. So. It was wonderful. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you have found this podcast valuable, there are many ways in which you can support it. You can share it with friends and on your social media. You can leave us a review on your favorite podcast listening app. And you can visit our Patreon page, patreon.com backslash a state of mind. For show notes and more information unique to each episode, visit astateofmindplay.com. And to learn more about my work as a therapist, meditation teacher, and coach, visit julianocean.com.
www.thinkandgrowthpodcast.us. And please don't hesitate to send me a message or email and let me know what you think and contribute to our conversation. Thank you so much for your support. It is listeners like you that make all this so very much worthwhile. 